We're all human. And it's important to know that doctors are people, too. Doctors have emotions, they have passions in life and hobbies, and they enjoy participating as active members in the communities where they practice medicine. Doctors have families, friends, and relationships. While the latest in healthcare and the most current treatments for ailments will be topics on this Doctors Are People 2 radio TV show, the focus will be in learning more about the interesting aspects in a physician's life and what they do away from the doctor's office or operating room table. Hello, South Florida and beyond. Welcome to Doctors Are People 2 and um, globally on the iHeartRadio app, on YouTube, on Amp2.tv, wherever you can find radio these days, tune in, etc. We're probably there on their app. And, of course, live here in the studio on 1470 AM, um, WWNN, and I'll give out their information soon. But we have Dr. Dominic Carrera on the line Dr. Carrera, how are you today? Hey, good evening. How are you doing? Great, and I wanted to have you on because I know you've been doing a lot of ESPN radio, and you've been um, there's been a lot of foot and ankle um, injuries in the NFL, and then recently um, Odell Beckham's hip pointer, and I know you do hip preservation. So um, we have Dr. Dominic Carrera on the line. He's a foot and ankle surgeon, hip preservation with Florida Institute of Orthopedic Surgical Specialists in Broward County, but he also has patients um, from Palm Beach County as well. So I know you talked a lot about the Jones surgery this week. I wanted to ask you something that I ran into when I played, and um, that is turf toe, and that can be something that's kind of nasty. Can you kind of explain to us what turf toe is? Sure. Turf toe is an injury of the big toe or the hallux uh, in which the toe is actually bent backwards, so up towards the ankle excessively. It's usually in uh, football. Uh, oftentimes, the shoe wear in football is, is flexible and ankles are taped, and so the forces get focused more to the foot. And basically, when that big toe gets pushed back, typically it's in a, a position of tackling or one of the linemen uh, who gets uh, kind of uh, bent uh, at the knee and, and the foot gets bent back. Then that hyperextension causes damage to uh, the big toe. And uh, there's a lot of variability in terms of how extensively it can be damaged. Um, the high-grade injuries are the ones that require surgery, and those are very rare. It's the low-grade injuries that uh, are treated non-operatively, and oftentimes uh, after a few weeks, uh, patients can get back to full participation. Thanks, doctor, for explaining that because I was always wondering why we really see it a lot in football and not like um, basketball. But you explained it perfectly there. It's the the shoes that you know we're wearing to play play the game. I know um, when I had it, I was an off I was a fullback, but then later was an offensive lineman, and then a friend of mine had it, and he was a fullback. So that that really helps us um, understand it. We're here with Doctor Dominic Carrera, um, pronounced um, like the Porsche Carrera. That's the best way to remember it. Um, can you tell me a, a little bit about um, what you do for, I know we've been talking about, a lot about foot and ankles lately, but what you do for Achilles tendon repairs, you do a, a Achilles tendon insertion repair. Well, what is that? When is that needed? Yeah, so there's really two main types of Achilles injuries that we see. One are ruptures um, that, require, that, that may require surgery. The ruptures usually happen in the tendon itself. So it's a little bit higher up above the heel bone, uh, and it's a te- it's all tendon injury, and those are the ones that can- they really can be treated in two different ways: operatively, which actually allows typically for a faster return uh, with greater strength and a less lesser a lower probability of re tear, um, versus non-operative treatment, uh, which is also a, a reasonable option. Um, in, at the insertion, so where the Achilles inserts all the way down into the bone, that's typically more of a wear and tear injury that we see in uh, older patients. So it's t- those are typically patients in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, whereas the acute tears that are a little higher up in the tendon occur typically in the weekend warriors uh, and athletes that are in their 30s to, to 50s. Um, and are, uh, you know, out trying to play sports, uh, 
it may have gained a little weight over the years, and that tendon doesn't like that extra force on it. I see. So for those um, higher tears, the weekend warrior, 30s to 50s, um, kind of um, overweight guys doing too much and, 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 and um, gals as well doing too much on the weekend, what is the timetable for retur- uh, return to normal quality of life from a surgery like that? Right. So uh, we have minimally invasive surgeries now, which are really uh, a trend um, in the last five uh, years, I would say. Uh, those uh, the advantage of the surgery, and especially when it's minimally invasive, is that uh, patients can get back faster to standing or weight bearing activities. So we use uh, boots that have wedges in them, and the wedges allow the heel to be raised up off uh, off the ground more. That allows uh, the patients to actually walk on it uh, within two weeks. So I had a patient today who came back uh, from a surgery on Friday who I'm letting walk on it starting today. So. If they're protected in the boot with the wedges, um, these recoveries are much faster than what we were doing, you know, even 10, 15 years ago. Um, and it's uh, there's, the technology has helped us to do less invasive surgeries and do quicker rehabs, and we don't have to be quite as concerned with the incisions and their healing and protecting protecting these patients because the incisions are smaller. Wow, that's great to hear, um, Dr. Carrera, and the, the minimally invasive surgeries that you're offering. Um, now, I've heard um, arthroscopy for the the knee and I believe shoulder, but you also do, uh, it's also something that is used for um, ankle and foot injuries as well. Can you explain that a bit? Sure. Yeah. So minimally invasive arthroscopic treatments uh, can uh, be used actually in in a lot of different joints in orthopedics. Uh, the areas that I've been a part of, including in their development in part, uh, have been in the foot and ankle and uh, hip. And in those areas in particular, there have been more recent advances, uh, more, more so than in the knee and the shoulder. So the shoulder and knee are thought to be more the classic sports injury joints, um, and more people have heard of their uh, treatments uh, arthroscopically. The um, injuries of the hip, because it's a tight joint and it's a deeper joint, those have been treated much more recently uh, with um, arthroscopic treatment. In the in the foot and ankle, uh, most of the treatments are to the ankle joint. Um, some are to the what we call the subtalar joint, which is the joint just below the ankle joint. And then there's also treatments for the big toe. Um, and for the lesser joints of, of the forefoot. So, um, yeah, there's a, there's a, a few different options um, that exist. I, my, back, my background is in sports medicine as well as in foot and ankle, so my, my uh, skills in arthroscopic techniques came from fellowship or specialized training in it, and then I uh, have used a lot of those skills in my uh, foot and ankle uh, practice. We're here with Dr. Dominic Carrera, foot and ankle surgeon, hip preservation specialist at the Florida Institute of Orthopedic Surgical Specialists. Uh, The best website is fiosortho.com. That's F-I-O-S-S, ortho.com. And he's at 954-792-1010. That's 954-792-1010. Dr. Carrera, tell us a little bit about uh, FIOS or the Florida Institute of Orthopedic Surgical Specialists. So we're a group of uh, subspecialists in orthopedics, which means we, we provide subspecialized care. And we have our specialties, and I think that uh, nowadays where uh, patients have access to uh, different providers, including subspecialists in orthopedics, we can best provide optimal care by having not only a focus in those specialty areas, but also a lot of experience in dealing with those specific problems in orthopedics. Uh, So uh, the Florida Institute of Orthopedic Surgical Specialists is at Broward in 95. Essentially, if you're uh, on the highway at 95, you can actually see the building uh, where our practice is. And currently, we have a joint replacement surgeon um, who's a, a specialist in hip and knee replacement uh, a sports medicine physician who uh, specializes uh, mostly in knee and shoulder, but um, has a, a lot of experience in uh, surg- I'm sorry, in sports injuries uh, around the human body. And then myself as a hip preservation specialist, 
uh, for young adults and adolescents, as well as a foot and ankle uh, specialist. Let's talk a bit about hip preservation because I really never thought of much about the hip um, until um, a family member of mine had hip surgery recently. And then, of course, when my fantasy football, Odell Beckham, had a hip pointer and I'm wondering whether or not to start him or not. So um, if you could tell me first what a hip pointer is and then um, some of the um, hip treatments that you provide. Sure. So a, a hip pointer is essentially a contusion or a bruise uh, around the bony prominence, which is the uh, the iliac crest. The crest is what you can actually feel just above your your hip, um, along the outside part of your of the flank, um, and and typically that's the a, a big bone that you can feel underneath uh, the skin. So the reason that that gets bruised is because it is somewhat prominent of a bone. And uh, an athlete can either be hit in that area or can land on that area, and it causes bruising around it. So in the case of Odell Beckham, he was um, jumping for a ball. He's a, he's a receiver. Um, he was hit in the air somewhat by another, I'm sorry, by the defender, and he, he somewhat twisted and landed uh, on his side from, a, uh, from quite a high jump. And so that all that force landing directly on that one um, area where the bone is, is uh, essentially just underneath the skin uh, can cause a bruise. And the, in his case, he was able to keep on playing uh, the rest of the game. He actually had a great game, um, and uh, it causes, uh, as, like a bruise, it just causes soreness, irritation, um, and can limit uh, uh, participation. But uh, the main thing that uh, it... Uh, causes is a limitation activity. It's not typically a surgical surgical problem. It's just irritating. It's pain. It's pain. An athlete gets hit in that area again, um, just hurt. Um, it's not causing necessarily permanent damage, but it it can be quite painful. Um, Doctor Kerr, what other uh, treatments for the hip do you you provide? And and which were. Oh, did I lose you there? We may have lost Dr. Dominic Carrera there, but I'm sure he'll he'll call right back in. He gave us a nice play-by-play of the hip pointer. But um, so Dr. Dominic Carrera is on staff at uh, Florida Institute of uh, Surgical Specialists. Um, we talked a little bit about ankle and foot arthritis, uh, ankle and foot arthroscopy, which I butchered the first time. Um, I wanted to ask him about ankle lig- ligament reconstruction because I have an issue uh, old football injury that I, I turn my ankle every once in a while and it feels like I stepped in a hole and then I look and there's no hole there. So that's kind of tough. But um, let's take a break on Doctors Are People too, and we'll be right back on the other side. My dad is a cardiologist, and so I have two brothers, and we were all equally painful to my mom. And so to get us out of the hospital, we would go on rounds with him on Saturdays and Sundays in the hospital uh, back in Oklahoma City. And we used to you know, race wheelchairs down the hallways from the time I was about six years old. When I was a freshman in high school, I got to watch my first heart transplant. Uh, but I think what really kind of made me want to be a doctor was around the holidays, uh, the house always filled up with tons of gifts from thankful patients and to impact people's lives like that in a positive manner was something that was very exciting to me. I'm very patient oriented. I care about the patients both professionally and personally and, and not only about their result but also that I'm passionate about new technologies. I'm passionate about research and I'm passionate about offering them the best technology available with the lowest risk and with the best outcome. What you want in a physician is someone who is personable, works as a team, embraces new technology, uh, is clearly accomplished, but I think most importantly is somebody who you get confidence in, and the way I would have confidence is if I had a condition, I would read as much about it as, as I could before I showed up, probably off the internet, and then ask very directed questions. I do a lot of exercise. Running is what I use to kind of calm my brain down and kind of sort my thoughts out. So I enjoy, uh, I just will put my shoes on and go for a run and then uh, I do mix in a little bit of yoga, something probably not many people know about me. I keep that on the down low, uh, but so I do do some yoga and I go to the gym like most people.
You are listening to Doctors Are People Too with David DePino, who shows us the human side of medical doctors in the community. If you have a question for our guest, call into the show at 888-565-1470. Now, let's get back to the fun side of doctors and show that they are people too. Hey, we're back on Doctors Are People Too. Uh, Dr. Carrera, I just have three more questions. I don't want to keep you too much longer. I know you have, you know, doctors are people too, and and you have a family member you have to pick up. Are you there? Thank you. Appreciate it. It's good to be on the show. Awesome. So let me if let me rip through these free these three, and um, we'll have you on in the future. I want to talk you talk to you about ankle ligament reconstruction. I personally um had an old football injury. And I'll be brief with this, but if it, it my left ankle always turns, it feels like I stepped in a hole and it turns out of the blue. And then I'll look down and there's no hole there in the grass or anything. So I wonder if you ever heard of anything like that. And then if you can explain your treatments for ankle ligament reconstruction. Sure. So uh, that's a classic ankle instability uh, or sprains that lead to that. Uh, there's a... a quite a bit of variability in terms of how unstable an ankle can be. Usually it's the lateral ligaments of the human body that are torn. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, the most common scenario is that the lateral ligaments or the ligaments on the outside part of the ankle are torn. And what happens is that when they get damaged, they don't have the ability to, to heal totally normally. Uh, they are able to scar some, but they don't typically have the same functional ability in terms of keeping the ankle stable as if they were never injured. So uh, there are grades of instability, and especially if the ankle's twisted several times, that instability can happen with simple things like just walking down the street. Uh, if, the gr- if the ground's a little uneven, it can lead to those twisting type of episodes. So um, the, the, the surgical treatment for it is indicated when the ankle is recurrently unstable, which means that it keeps on happening, um, and, that, and attempts should be made to try and prevent that with uh, things like bracing or with physical therapy. The other reason to have surgery if the ankle is, is chronically painful. So because of these episodes of instability, if the ankle still continues to hurt, it can be stabilized. I'm actually part of an international ankle instability group, so we're a group of international surgeons looking at this problem and trying to look at uh, new and innovative ways to uh, treat ankle instability. And I've actually developed a surgery that's all arthroscopic and, uh, and uses cadaver tendon to uh, stabilize the ankle. So it's an area of particular interest uh, to me, along with the use of minimally invasive surgeries, but also improving on a problem that um, is actually incredibly common uh, ankle sprains are the most common sprains of the human body. Uh, they don't all, they don't need surgery typically, but the ones that do, um, although we have very good surgeries in a lot of cases, uh, there is I think some room for improvement. Dr. Carrera, that's great. Looking at your um, website on, at fiasortho.com. That's f i o s s ortho.com. I see that you have on your areas of interest. You have about six um, ankle treatments there. So I, I know that's um, dear to your heart to get people back, you know, um, to a quality of life where they can be mobile. Um, I want to also ask you a little bit about ankle and foot arthritis treatment. Although, I, you know, I've had my ankle issues, but I haven't really had um, the pain or instability from the arthritis. I think I got it more in my hands at this age. But tell me a little bit about ankle and foot arthritis and what, what you can do to help um, people out. So uh, arthritis can be treated with a number of treatments that we know are, are, are true of arthritis of any joint of the human body. So medications like non anti-inflammatories can help. Uh, those are uh, ibuprofen, uh, Aleve. Um, those are the most common ones that are used. So that's one treatment option. Activity modification, uh, uh, avoiding activities that can put ac- increased stress on those joints can also help. Um, weight loss, if it's a lower extremity uh, problem, um, meaning if it's hips, knees, sh- uh, foot and ankle, uh, taking some weight off um, can help um, a lot of patients. Um, other things that are um, not as well proven but can also help are turmeric, 
uh, which is basically a food supplement, or glucosamine chondroitin, which is um, a, uh, an, a supplement. It's not even a medication that I've found uh, that some patients benefit from. Um, those would all be options. An- another option would be uh, an injection. So injections are, tip- temp- are typically temporizing, meaning they uh, buy patients' time in the setting of arthritis to potentially uh, avoid uh, surgical intervention. And, the- and patients who failed uh, treatments, then uh, we do have surgical treatment options that are available in the ankle and foot. Um, I typically do those uh, surgical uh, treatments with a fusion uh, procedure uh, completed arthroscopically, which is minimally invasive surgery. Again, uh, small incisions have been associated with lower infections, uh, faster rehabilitation, uh, lower, uh, less, I'm sorry, less bleeding, um, and higher fusion rates. A fusion rate means that the bones that are intended to be to, to heal as part of the procedure actually can uh, have been demonstrated to heal more quickly uh, in these surgeries if it's performed arthroscopically. Fascinating. I had no idea that there was this kind of expertise with the ankle, but it's great to have you aboard on Doctors Are People too, and really great. I want to give you one um, last question, and we're here with Dr. Dominic Carrera, foot and ankle surgeon, hip preservation specialist at the Florida Institute of Orthopedic Surgical Specialists. That's Fios, ortho.com, F-I-O-S-S, ortho.com, and his number is 954-792-1010. I um, found some information on you. Um, the MASH Study Group, will you tell us a little bit about um, the MASH Study Group? I wanna, and, and I want to give the website out. It's mashstudy.com. Yeah, so a MASH study group is a a very exciting uh, project that I uh, founded and I'm currently the president of. Um, This group is a group of surgeons nationally who are interested in looking at outcomes of hip arthroscopy. Uh, Basically, our goal is to pool data. So we agreed upon a a data set uh, of important factors in looking at outcomes uh, for this surgery. And uh, when, when you look at outcomes, and particularly if there's a number of different factors that can affect outcomes, having a large data set is helpful to try and uh, make uh, useful uh, determinations in terms of which factors are important. So in, in our group, we're uh, uh, currently, I think, 13 surgeons. Uh, we're pooling our data together. Uh, to uh, enable us to significantly empower our work to be able to uh, ask, I'm sorry, to be able to answer difficult questions that a single surgeon experience is not capable of. Um, So it's a really exciting area, not only in terms of uh, what we're trying to answer specific to hip arthroscopy, but also it's an exciting area in orthopedics in that uh, with some of the advances technologically, uh, in software and web-based computing, we can now uh, do this not only in this area, but it's setting an example uh, for other areas in orthopedics where similar studies will uh, be done, I think, in the not-too-distant future. That's great news, Dr. Carrera. I just want to thank you so much for coming on Doctors Are People too, um, and telling us a lot about what's going on in, in the world of, you know, foot, ankles, and, and hip preservation, which is uh, is a new topic that I'm learning a little bit about. Um, thanks again. Will you come on aboard in the future on Doctors Are People too? I sure will. Thanks a lot for having me. And uh, if you have any questions, please uh, uh, reach us at the office. I'm happy to take care of uh, anyone who's on the, on the line or needs help. Thank you so much, Dr. Carrera. That's Dr. Dominic Carrera. It's uh, pronounced just like the Porsche Carrera, and he's a foot and ankle surgeon, hip preservation specialist at Florida Institute of Orthopedic Surgical Specialists. That's FiasOrtho.com, F-I-O-S-S, Ortho.com. He told us a little bit about his MASH study group. That's MASHstudy.com. You can reach Dr. Dominic Carrera at 954-792-1010. And in studio tonight, I have Dr. Noah Schreibman. Um, he's the medical director of not only the sleep lab at Delray Medical Center and West Boca Medical Center, but also 
the new program of um, dealing with critical care at Delray Medical Center. We're going to get into all that. Dr. Schreibman, how are you tonight? Very good. Thank you for having me. And thanks for coming aboard on Doctors Are People, too. Now, I actually have a tie-in to the sleep lab at West Boca Medical Center. I think I'm going to be one of your patients. My uh, primary care, Dr. Uh, Raul Perez-Vasquez, I actually asked him for a sleep study, and he originally was going to give me the, the take-home one, but he said, you know what, you know, I think uh, if, if you can spend overnight at West Boca, I think it, it would be a better study. So I want to ask you a lot of questions about that. Can I, I can bring my wife and I just sleep overnight. You guys hook me up with all the monitors and then you look at it and you tell me what's right or wrong. Is that how it works? That's pretty much how it works. Is it kind of like a hotel um, the setting? Ho the whole idea is that when you have a sleep study, you're supposed to simulate a person's regular night. So it, even though it's in the hospital, it doesn't look anything like a regular hospital bed. You know, there's a nice lounge area, nice kitchen, the furniture's beautiful, you know, plasma TV, all the, all the, all the uh, acuities. When um, we always tell people to always do what they usually do at night so that the study is sort of like an adequate measure of what usually happens to them when they're in their house. For instance, if somebody always has one glass of wine at night with dinner, that's what you do the night of the sleep study. If somebody never drinks coffee, don't have, don't drink like 80 ounces of coffee the day of the sleep study. If you never eat red meat, don't have three giant steaks the night of the sleep study as well. We, we have people show up at the sleep lab about 8.30 at night. You go home about 6.30, 7 o'clock the next morning. And as you, as you alluded to, there's about 10 or 11 different things we monitor on somebody when they sleep. And, you know, we get a printout the next day and we interpret the studies and then we sort of try to figure out what exactly is causing that individual's problems at nighttime. So this is, um, you go to the hospital, it's a, it's, a, it's a room that has all the bells and whistles. I, I know I've seen the one at Del Rey when I was a reporter for the Sun Sentinel. He even had a TV. It looked like a hotel room or like a, that, a new hotel room. That, the, the whole idea is to put the patient's mind at ease. So you want, the last thing you want the patient to think is, oh, I'm here for a medical study. All we want them to do is sleep, and we just want we, we just want it to be as as close to a uh, what what usually happens at home. Okay, so uh, yeah, you want to get that normal data of of exactly what's going on um, with the patient, so you can read it as well. So this is something that the um, a patient I talked to my primary care, and he actually filled out a paper, and I just. Um, call up the number. So this is something that we can talk to our, our primary care physician about, or can we go directly to the hospital? Most, most sleep diagnoses are first identified, believe it or not, not from, the, not from the specialist, not from the internist, not from the general practitioner. It's from the person's husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend. It's always, it's always the significant other that, 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 that sees the problem first. You know, why, why is he coughing and choking all night long? Why can't he stop moving when he sees? Why is he gasping for air? Oh, my God, it looked like he stopped breathing for 10 seconds and snort. You know, it's always it, the person's asleep. So he doesn't so he or she doesn't know what's happening. It's always the significant other that tells us, you know, the, the common thing that we always hear. You know, I'm in the office. Hi, I'm Dr. Shrine. What are you here for? My wife told me to come. You know, it's that, mm -hmm. that's always the first thing that we hear. And my wife said all of those things. And um, I've even woke up from that gasp um, a few times. But um, listeners, don't go to sleep. We're going to uh, take a real quick break. And on the other side, we're going to talk to Dr. Schreibman about everything in the world of uh, pulmonology, sleep medicine, and critical care on Doctors Are People Too. Hi, my name is Dr. Rahul Agarwal. I'm an interventional cardiologist in Jupiter, Florida. I did my medical school at the University of Florida and my internship and residency at the same program. I did my chief residency also at Chance and then did my cardiology and interventional cardiology at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I specialize in general cardiology, interventional cardiology, and nuclear cardiology. Even though I'm an interventional cardiologist, the majority of my practice involves general cardiology. General cardiology is a pretty broad spectrum in that it involves rhythm problems such as atrial fibrillation, heart disease such as coronary disease, congenital heart disease, high blood pressure, and cholesterol problems. I do procedures such as uh, cardioversions, which involve trying to convert the patient back to a normal rhythm if they have an arrhythmia. I also deal with 
plumbing problems such as the coronary arteries, which if they're blocked, I can do angioplasty and stents, which involves balloons that open up the arteries. And these stents act as scaffolds that keep these arteries open. I really do believe in preventive medicine, and one of the areas that I really focus on is diet. One can really get caught up on the pills aspect and the exercise and diet we talk about a lot, but unless one really has some guidance as to where to go with diet, it can be quite difficult. So I do give my patients homework uh, in terms of books or movies that they can rent or uh, obtain so that they can get educated. Our cardiology office is located in the Abacoa area of Jupiter, Florida, conveniently located between two of the local hospitals. We provide echocardiography, stress testing, ultra monitoring, and general cardiology office visits. We really pride our practice in its staff. We're very courteous and professional. We believe that under our care, you'll feel the same way too. You are listening to Doctors Are People Too with David DePino, who shows us the human side of medical doctors in the community. If you have a question for our guest, call into the show at 888-565-1470. Now, let's get back to the fun side of doctors and show that they are people too. And we're back on Doctors Are People Too um, on 1470 AM and then also on the iHeartRadio app and amp2.tv on the YouTube channel, one of my favorite channels to see all of the the different radio shows going on here in, in Palm Beach County in South Florida. We're here with Dr. Noah Schreibman, and we were just getting in talking a little bit about the sleep labs, and I have a lot of questions about that. So um, there's actually technicians that um, hook us up at 8.30 p.m. before we go to bed, and then um, all night long we can, we can bring a... Um, a family member we can bring our wife i think we established that as well um and then you actually you come in the next day and read the results and kind of tell us if there's something close to sleep apnea or maybe a couple you can maybe correct. share a couple, uh, some of the conditions correct there's um when i said there's that you're hooked up to a bunch of wires you know you're your heart is monitored during the study your brain with an eeg monitor is studied there is an oxygen electrode placed on your finger to check your oxygen levels at night. There is a microphone placed near your mouth to listen to you snore. And we also put a couple of electrodes on your arms and legs to measure muscle tone because these things all help us determine exactly what stage of sleep you're in. And it determines, uh, it helps us differentiate when somebody's asleep and when somebody's awake on the printout the next day. And it looks for, we, we look for a lot of different things. We look for sleep disorder breathing, such as sleep apnea, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. We can also see signs of, of another condition known as narcolepsy. There are, other, there are also other conditions where people uh, just have leg jerks at night, and that can wake people up as well. And, and these things are um, chronically underdiagnosed in the medical community, but they're, they're important because they have real medical implications. I know you can't share exact um, stories, but have you ever had any cases of sleepwalking where you guys have been able to notice it there and then help well, someone out? Everybody's videotaped. Oh, so, wow. So, you know, you actually see people get up and walk around. And try to go make a sandwich and there's no refrigerator there, mm -hmm. though? Yep. Seen that, too. Oh, wow. Unbelievable. And, we, and like, I just want to establish this. We can bring our um, significant other and they sleep right next to us in the actual room. Because you we, want we, the exact... Yeah, not... not Physically in the bed, but but especially if somebody is oh, prone okay. to disorientation at nighttime, you know, then yeah, we do make allowances to let the, the the significant others at least in the room and so forth. Okay, do they sleep in a room or in a bed right Co next to you? Correct. Okay, I get it. Okay, so you want to make sure you get the, all the the results from the the main patient. Yes. Okay, I see, and you want to make it as as homely as possible. And I've seen these sleep labs. I've seen not the one at West Boca, but the one at Del Rey. And I, I, the guy there was named Joel, and he really uh, gave me a, a great tour. I don't know if he's still there, but Joel's uh, out in Seattle now. <laughs> oh, Joel went to Seattle. I was going to give Joel a shout out and be like, "Oh, yeah, Joel, Joel's out in well, Seattle now. Yeah, he kinda, he's uh, running a lab out there." Oh, good to hear. Yeah. Wow. Well, you guys trained him right. I mean, Seattle's a up and coming. Well, always has been an up and coming, uh, cool place. Let's talk a little bit about um, your private practice because I want to get the word out there before I forget. Um, now. Your your only um, medical specialty isn't sleep. I mean, you're you're a pulmonologist. You treat a lot of different ailments. We're going to get to some of them, but um, tell me about a little bit about um, your practice. Practice, and I'm going to butcher this. 
Edelman, Baron, and Schreibman. That's pretty good. You did pretty, pretty good. Pretty good for the first time. Yeah, we're we're a, we're a three we're a three partner private practice practice in pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine in Boca Raton and Delray Beach. Okay, are they um, sleep doctors and in, internists as well? They do a, a pulmonary critical care, uh, some sleep. I'm the predominant sleep doctor of the practice. Okay, now. so that's what that was what you specialize in the practice. I'm just going to give the info out here. Uh, the practice is in Boca Raton on the campus of West Boca Medical Center right there. It's 9980 Central Park Boulevard North, Suite 322 in Boca Raton. That's Suite 322. Um, five, six, one, four, eight, eight, two, nine, eight, eight. And, um, this is genius. You have a spot in Delray beach as well. 15, uh, one, five, three, four, zero jog road, suite two Oh three in Delray beach. And the number there is five, six, one, four, nine, eight, seven, three, three, two. And now tell me a little bit about, um, what other, uh, treatments, um, for the, I guess a pulmonologist treats the lungs so i wanted one of the things i want to talk about is um something we've heard so much in the news is copd um i believe it's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease chronic, Did I get it right? chronic obstructive pulmonary disease most lay people sort of interchange copd and emphysema but emphysema is really only one subset of copd copd also encompasses what, what's known as chronic bronchitis it also encompasses another chronic condition known as bronchiectasis. And depending on who you talk to and which textbook you read, some people will even include asthma or asthmatic bronchitis into COPD as well. Now, is COPD, I'm always thinking of it caused by smoking, but can it be caused by um, genetics or, or asthma or something some, as well? Some about... <sighs> About 15 to 20% of all patients with emphysema or COPD are lifelong non-smokers. So that's always generated um, interest as far as what makes people predisposed to these conditions. And, um, you know, there are environmental toxins, there are fumes, there are dust. You know, you always talk about, oh. nine, you know, you talk about what happened with 9-11, you know, like the, the quote-unquote 9-11 lungs. Where you where you had all these, especially a lot of the first responders, and they ended up with lungs that were, you know, at least by functionality testing and at least by architecture, look like COPD ish lungs, so to speak. There's also a genetic component as well, and we and we know that um, from just you know studies that, that that show you know the the amount of people that don't smoke that end up with COPD, and they, there's there's a cluster in families with that as well. Wow. See, um, I always thought of it as just the smoking disease, but that's why we have doctors on the show. To we see, you know, most of what we see are, are patients that are chronic smokers, but you know, we, we do see patients as well that, that unfortunately has, have these conditions that have never had a cigarette. So um, hypothetically, it could be um, someone who's painting or sandblasting and breathing in fumes. There's all kinds of different conditions that mimic COPD. Those, what, what you just alluded to are, are different types of lung okay. conditions that, that mimic it. But, but like I said, the, the genetic thing is a big proponent, is a big component of this as well. And is there, do you really hear like the commercial, like it's like an elephant was on my chest kind of thing sitting on my chest? Very is that really very, what it... Very common thing that patients tell us. So it's like a compressed feeling that yeah, they're feeling and can't there breathe? Are, apparently there are very few things that are as disconcerting and as frightening to people as the, not, as the sensation of not being able to take a deep breath in. And, you know, unfortunately in, in our community, the age range of our patients, the amount of smoking that we see down here, we unfortunately hear that all the time. Wow. And that's um, something that um, a family member or if you have it yourself, you need to get it taken care of right away because I, I believe, and you'll help me with this, it's it's not something that's going to get better over time. There's you not, can only kind yeah, of stop it. Un unfortunately, the lungs do not the lungs do not regenerate themselves. Um, you know, all the medicines out there, all of the treatments, all of the treatment modalities that we have are basically geared toward taking are basically geared toward symptom relief. It's not geared toward regenerating lung tissue. You know, the mm -hmm. only the only true cure, quote unquote for end-stage lung disease is lung transplant, which has its own set of problems. Mm -hmm. And that would be um, obviously a cardiothoracic surgeon. That's a surgeon that would Correct. have to put in an implant of a lung. Yes. Wow, and that seems like um, something that would uh, probably you don't want to get to unless no. you have to, right? That's, that, is, that is true. Now, um, COPD as well, it's something that um, 
uh, the, the uh, someone can talk to their primary care about and be referred to you, and then you can help them with not only the treatment, but I guess there's a rehabilitation that goes along with it. There's there's, there's multiple facets of, of, of treating people that have these conditions. The first thing is obviously to get rid of the smoking habit. Mm-hmm. The second thing is medication to get rid to, to, to help with their symptoms. The third thing is physical therapy or what's com- more commonly known as pulmonary rehab to strengthen all of the patient's other muscles of respiration because even though you can't regenerate the lungs, the theory being that if you can strengthen the muscles that aid in breathing, the muscles that aid in respiration, they can sort of compensate for some of the defects in the lung tissue that the smoking has caused. Wow. Well, that's great. Um, Well, it's not a great thing to have, but it's great that we have doctors in the area that, you know, um, can treat this. And I just want to give out your information again. It's Dr. Noah Schreibman, and he's at 9980 Central Park Boulevard North, Suite 322. That's in Boca Raton. It's on the campus of West Boca Medical Center. The number there is 561-488-2988. And also um, in Delray Beach at 15340, that's 15340, Jog Road, Suite 203, Delray Beach, 561-498-7332. Now, you, you touched on asthma a little bit. Um, pulmonologist, um, is that someone who treats asthma? And is it yes. done in the office or is it a hospital setting? Can you... Well, the, the idea is to try to keep people out of the hospital as much as possible. Um, you know, hospitalizations are basically reserved for patients that no matter what you do for them as an outpatient, their symptoms, their, their quality of life is just such that they can't function. Okay. So obviously if they can get to see you in the office, it's, uh, it's way better to stay out of the, the hospital. You do, you do treatments right there in the office? Of course. Okay, that's good breathing, to know. Breathing treatments, testing, oxygen testing, what's known as pulmonary function tests to assess people's lung function and the, and the like. Okay, and then asthma, is that something as well that, that doesn't get better, but if you get it in time, you can kind of asthma keep is, it can, wor- Asthma, one of the hallmarks of asthma, one of the things that differentiates asthma from emphysema is that asthma, quote-unquote, is a reversible airways disease. In other words, if you when you do breathing tests on somebody with emphysema, that person may feel great. But if they have emphysema, you're going to see a problem on their breathing tests. On the other hand, an asthmatic, if they're having a good day and they're compliant with their medications, their breathing tests may look like yours or mine. Wow. And then if they're on that medication and have seen a doctor for treatment, maybe they just have to have an inhaler in case of something. We always, you know, other if, than you, that. if you have a choice between having asthma or COPD, you'd much rather have asthma because of the reversibility of the process. Oh, does it wow. doesn't go away but it's but but when you when when somebody with asthma is good mm-hmm. their, their their numbers look like somebody that doesn't have a problem and that's because of medicine and the, and the inhaler correct okay yeah i've always wanted to ask that question i had a friend growing up um who always carried the inhaler luckily she never had to use it but i was i never ha- you know had it myself is is that something that's genetic asthma or loosely gen- loosely, loosely genetic. genetic it's never really been it's mm-hmm. it's not like some of these medical disorders where you know, they, they've isolated the gene, they've isolated the chromosome, but, but you know, the fact that these things run in families, we know that there's a genetic component to it. I see. Um, we're going to take one last break and then um, come back on the other side and talk a little bit more about sleep apnea, which I want to get back into, and the new critical care program at Delray Medical Center. Um, we'll finish with that on Doctors Are People too. I make a dinner. For me and my girlfriend, we ate, we enjoyed the, the dinner, it was very good. She was ready to go to sleep. I said, okay, I'm going to stay on the couch a little bit to watch TV. I started to, to feel something in my throat, like it, I was choking. And all of a sudden, I felt the, the pain, the sharp pain, like it's somebody put a knife in, the, in your back and open and do like this. That was when I, I called my, my girlfriend. I said, you have to take me to the hospital. I couldn't die. When they were doing the test, they saw something. Something was weird. My bulb was ripped. I said, God, please help me to get out of this. Dr. Bayer was on call. He was who, who performed my, my surgery. I described like an angel. I described like a, he was there to do that for me. My girlfriend, my, my son, he told me when they saw him getting out from the operation room. He was sweating. He was tired to be there for 
10 hours. For me, it's unbelievable. I can walk, I can exercise a little bit, and I can drink red one, that light red one. Of course, one glass or two glasses. No more. I see the life different. And I, wanna, I want to see my, my granddaughter to grow and my, my son to get old. So I want to I wanna leave. I think that God gave me one more chance in life. And I had to take advantage of this. You are listening to Doctors Are People Too with David DePino, who shows us the human side of medical doctors in the community. If you have a question for our guest, call into the show at 888-565-1470. Now, let's get back to the fun side of doctors and show that they are people too. And we're back on Doctors Are People Too with Dr. Noah Schreibman, a medical director of the Sleep Labs at Delray Medical Center and West Boca Medical Center. And so far we've hit on so much. We talked about asthma, COPD, um, sleep disorders, and, and uh, the actual test for it, which I think is very important to understand that, you know, um, it's a very easy test. You spend overnight in the hospital, but it's really like you're in a hotel room. Um, I've actually seen it with my own eyes at Delray Medical Center, so... Um, not just um, kind of um, sugarcoating. It's a, it's a real deal, um, kind of like hotel hospital room. So it's like the concierge, I, I like to call it. I want to talk to you a little bit more about sleep apnea now. Um, is sleep apnea is something you can actually pass away with? You said you, 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 you have shortness of breath, but you can actually not wake up? Best defensive tackle and of all time in the NFL, Reggie White died of sleep apnea. Is that what he died of? That's what he died of. So he never woke up? Never woke up. Oh my gosh. Wow. I didn't know that. Um, I thought he had had a heart attack, but it was actually sleep apnea. Wow. And he died at a young age, didn't he? he was in his 40s. In his 40s. Whoa. Yeah. And he wasn't the biggest of the linemen either. I mean, he was no. a big guy. No. But he was like a very athletic lineman. Yes, he was. I did not know that. Unbelievable. So, um, looking back at that case or anything was he already was he diagnosed with it or was just kind of no. something no he didn't even know huh man so um if someone gets a test um for sleep apnea obviously you read it and there's some treatment options we all think of the mask but there are other options as well maybe not as it's it, when we see sleep apnea we try to grade it in terms of severity mild moderate or severe sleep apnea and we basically go by the amount of pauses, breathing pauses that somebody has per hour. You have greater than 30 pauses an hour, that's considered severe sleep apnea. 15 to 30 pauses an hour is considered moderate sleep apnea. 5 to 15 pauses an hour is considered mild sleep apnea. Less than 5 pauses an hour is considered normal. Oh, okay. reason, reason why sleep apnea is, and people ask us all the time, okay, so I have sleep apnea, why is it important? Well, it's important for a bunch of different reasons. The first reason is quality of life. You know, if somebody has sleep apnea, they're basically chronically, if think of it as a state of chronic sleep deprivation because you're never getting solid sleep, you're never getting into deep sleep. So what do people who are chronically sleep deprived to complain about? I'm exhausted all the time. My wife says I'm miserable all the time because I'm always ornery. My friends say I'm a, a, a beast to be around because I'm always nasty. I can't concentrate at work. I fall asleep during the day. I, God forbid, I almost re had a car accident because I fell asleep. You know, I, I like doze off while I'm driving. So those are the quality of life reasons to get treated. But there are medical reasons to get treated too. Sleep apnea that's untreated is associated with increased risk of heart disease and increased risk of high blood pressure and a three times increased risk of stroke versus the general population. That's the bad news. The good news is, is that if you treat somebody successfully for sleep apnea, that person's risk of all those things basically approximates somebody who does not have sleep apnea. So this is one of the few things in medicine that we really can, that the medical community really can make a very positive impact for. And the two treatment options uh, that we most if, know about? If somebody has moderate or severe sleep apnea, then the treatment is usually what people refer to as the mask, okay. which is called a CPAP. The CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. What the CPAP mask is, is it's a tight seal around somebody's nose and mouth or just their nose. And basically, it's, the machine basically delivers pressurized air into your airway and that pressure sort of splays the airway open so that there's no blockage at nighttime. On the other hand, if somebody only has mild sleep apnea, then that person 
can probably get away with having a dentist fit them for something known as an oral appliance, which is something that looks like a retainer that kind of keeps the jaw aligned just so to keep the airway nice and open and can also work to keep the tongue out of the way of the back of the throat to keep the airway open. Wow, thank you so much for explaining that because it's confusing the general um, guy here. Um, so it's all about severity of the actual case then was, was yes. what the treatment option is. There, is- are, there are surgical options too for sleep apnea, but the reason why we try to dissuade patients from having surgical options, and by surgical options, you know, you can take away tissue in the back of the throat that's blocking the airway in more, uh, in more um, drastic surgeries that can actually like realign your jawline and so forth to keep the airway nice open. The reason why we try to dissuade people from doing surgery is because the data, the medical data is very, it's all over the map as far as how effective it is. And if you think about, and when the the most current analysis of the data is that surgery is about 50% effective for sleep apnea. So if you think about it, you're putting somebody through all the risk of surgery just in general, and basically, it's like a flip of the coin whether it works or not. See, so, you know, I, I don't really, me personally, I don't really like those odds too much. No, that makes total sense. If you're an overweight um, person as well, I mean, just to put them through surgery is a, a risk in itself, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th- th- there's a reason why they say first do no harm when you're in medical school. Yeah, wow. Um, is there any way to uh, bypass this problem, like a sleep position or anything? Or, or d- there are some, there are some. T- s- patients that have sleep apnea that's purely positional whereas really? you know you can notice that when they're on the, when the person's on their back they have significant uh, breathing pauses then when they roll onto their side they sort of go away um, and, and there have been some novel techniques where people like will like literally sew tennis balls into the back of their night shirts so that it's uncomfortable to lie on their back so that by second nature they'll sort of roll over to their side but but again if, if somebody has clinically significant sleep apnea even if it's purely positional we do recommend the CPAP therapy if it's moderate or severe in nature okay so it's something that needs to be tested I mean yes. you're not going to fool the, no. the 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 sleep apnea no, and, 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 and like I said, d- the doctors in general are, are really lousy at diagnosing people with sleep apnea because we don't always think about it. You know, the, the you know the sexy things are heart disease and mm-hmm. uh, and, and you know brain surgery. You know, people don't really think of sleep apnea a lot when they go to the doctor, but it's 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 an important consideration for the issues that I talked about before. Wow! Thanks so much for explaining all that with the the sleep and your. Um, Dr. Noah Schreiman, sleep medical director at Delray Medical Center, West Bo- Boca Medical Center. I wanted to get to this question. Um, tell us, um, so there's a, I want you to uh, tell the listeners about the new program at Delray Medical Center, but I know it, it's called the Critical Care Program, but what exactly is um, critical care? Critical care basically refers to the care of patients that are sick enough to warrant being in an intensive care unit. And what has happened over the last 20 years is they, we've, there's been a movement in this country to try to streamline care of patients in the intensive care unit to make their care more standardized, to make their care more evidence-based as far as what the medical literature wants, and to make the care less disorganized. Um, in the old days, if somebody went to the ICU and they were a complex patient, they may have 12 or 13 different specialists on their case for various problems. You know, there's, there's a doctor taking care of the patient's diabetes. There's a doctor taking care of their high blood pressure. There's a doctor taking care of their emphysema. There's a doctor taking care of their kidneys. Um, there's a doctor taking care of their, uh, you know, their brain tumor. And, and, and it was kind of, it was almost like the Tower of Babel. And, and the poor nurses would be getting feedback from 13 different people at one time. And there was no quarterback of the ship. What, what the, what has happened in the last 20 years or so is that there's been the, the invent of the what's called the intensivist model, where there is a quarterback doctor in the ICU that's coordinating the care for these very complex patients. And it's basically becoming standard of care across the country that, uh, that ICUs that are being manned by intensivists is really the way to go. And we're very excited in Delaware because we just because after talking about it for years and just trying to get the program started, the program just launched in, in May, and we're already seeing some really good things happen with the program. And that's the critical critical care program at Delray Medical Center. Correct. Okay. Now, um, and it started this this past May, so it's a brand new program. There's some big things happening at Delray Medical Center. I drove by it, and like, they're I, I'd read about it. they're building five uh, five story building on the on the front of the campus there. It's been it's been a top fifty hospital for cardiac care in the country for a long time, and the the uh, 
it's just the more, the more t- technology, newer techniques for heart disease, heart failure, and the like are coming, and that's one of the big uh, impetuses for for the the expansion of the campus. That's great to know right here in our community. <laughs> And I know there's going to be a helicopter pad on the top. They're already a, a tra- level, level, level one, one trauma, trauma center. center. Yes. Wow. Yes. And there's only two in Palm Beach County, I believe. That's correct. St. Mary's Medical Center and, and Delray I'm, Medical and Center. I'm obviously very biased as far as uh, who, who, yeah. what, I, what I think, but obviously, you know, I work with all these guys all the time, so I know the quality that they deliver. Well, uh, Delray Medical Center has been a pillar of the community for a long time, so it's great to see what they're they're doing over there. I know we just have a couple more minutes. I want to give out one more time. Um, your um, private practice info as well is Dr. Noah Schreibman. It's um, at 9980 Central Park Boulevard, suite number 322. That's 322 in Boca Raton. It's right on the campus of West Boca Medical Center there. It's um, right in the front there. I call it the west side um, that's um, bordering 441. Um, the number there is 561 and Dr. Noah Schreibman is at 1515340 Jog Road, Suite 203 in Delray Beach, 561-498-7332. Dr. Schreibman, I can't believe we're running out of time, but thank you so much for telling us so much about sleep, COPD, asthma. My pleasure. Everything we hit. We'll have to have you on again someday in the future to talk about your uh, beloved Philadelphia Eagles, but maybe that's a story for another day. <laughs> But they've had a good start, so better than my dolphins. I understand. Thank you so much again for being on Doctors Are People Too. My pleasure. Thank you for listening and watching Doctors Are People Too with David DePino. Join us next week for more in-depth views on what doctors are all about and how they spend their free time. All shows can be seen on amp2.tv. And if you have questions you want answered on the air, Call 866-224-5422 and leave a message that can be read on the air. The opinions expressed on the preceding sponsored program were strictly those of its hosts, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of the station, its staff, management, or sponsors.